Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this word. I ask that you would speak to us in a way that we just don't hear words, but we hear, we experience movement, we experience change, we experience transformation from the inside out. Lord, I cast down every spirit or energy or essence of suicide, depression, self-hatred, self-sabotage, anything that holds us back, fear, overthinking. Right now, I ask that we have a holy set-apart moment where your anointing can move in us, around us, through us. Teach us. Change us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. My son and I were having a conversation after his birthday. It was maybe two or three days after his birthday, and we're talking about the many different things that he received for his birthday, and I'm sitting there jealous because I'm looking at him like, you got more presents than I've ever received in my entire life. You got everything you wanted. He wanted a scorpion. And I told him, you're not getting a scorpion. We're not bringing some poisonous animal that can bite us, sting us, that has a stinger that's known for a stinger. Have you not heard the parable of the scorpion and the frog? What do scorpions do? They sting no matter how kind you are. No matter how much you feed it, that thing is going to hurt you. But then, you know, I felt the, uh, the trauma of childhood. I was like, I got to give him what he wants. <laughs> Otherwise, he'll never believe that you ask and you shall receive. So I went to the reptile store, and I, I was hoping that they didn't sell scorpions, but they sold scorpions. <laughs> they had a dune scorpion that glows in the dark. I was like, he'll love this. So I got him the scorpion, and I... And so we're talking about the scorpion. He talked about how he got his little, all his little other toys, that his auntie such and such, and, and they got him this. And, and Auntie Amanda got me a hoverboard. How come you didn't get me a hoverboard, Daddy? I know my role, <laughs> and she knows hers. And so he, we're talking about all these things, and he's like, I, I, I know, like, so how come you didn't get me this? How come you didn't get me this? I was like, son, I went, I, I went African in three seconds on him. I brought you into this world. I give you, for every day we celebrate your birthday, I give you a place to sleep. I give you a bed. I give you clothing. I give you running water in your house. I give you toilet you flush. Be grateful for the things that I give you daily. You receive a present from me. Happy birthday today. And my son looks at me and he's like, you're supposed to do that. You're my dad. And I'm like, Jazz, listen. I also gave you your forehead. I gave you your lips. Everyone say you look like me. I gave you all those things. And he looked at me and said, God gave me my body. You just give me stuff. And he walked away. He's like, God gave me my body. All you do is give me stuff. I was like, ouch. And I was like, wait a minute, Jazz, what did you say? And he looked at me like, where's the lie? Where's the lie, bro? All you do is give me stuff. In that moment, I was like, this kid just revealed a secret and a mystery that I wish most people would understand. That these stuff are lesser qualities and the thing that he has that is of real worth, he got from God. The thing that is of real worth, he got from God. He got from God. And so I want to talk to you about the profound mystery of what you got from God. And I'm starting this series called Glory to Glory. Glory to Glory, because I want us to discuss the management of glory. The management of what? Glory. glory. We go from glory to glory. That's what the Bible teaches us about believers. We're going from glory to glory. But if I talk to most believers that I talk to, I don't know who you talk to, but most Christians that I talk to never express the glory that they're walking in. All I hear is struggle to struggle. Can you help me out? Oh my goodness, you not believe what they did to me. Oh my goodness, you can't believe what she said to me. Oh my goodness, yeah, uh, they fired me from this job. Now I'm on unemployment. I'm, do, I'm dealing with this trouble. And, and everything is about all the things that suck in your life 
And you have no testimony of glory except when you come to church. Because that's where you put on that mask. How are you doing today? Giving honor to God who's the head of my life. I'd like to thank the Lord for being here. He's been so good. Just can't tell it all. Blessed and highly favored. Oh my. I mean, like, it's like, come on. Are you serious? Because you just cussed somebody out in the parking lot. The person you rode in the car with you does not see any glory at all. They just saw the backside of your. That's, is, am I telling the truth, Janae? Uh, see, Janae is always going to give me some pushback. But you know it's the truth. That's the truth for most. It's a fact. Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Distinctions between fact and truth. Amen. Some things are truth. Other things are facts. Amen. We'll talk about those distinctions in a few minutes. The management of glory. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is discussing a very profound mystery. He's talking about the glory that came with the law. He's discussing the new covenant. He said, this thing that we have in Jesus is a new covenant. It's not like the covenant that he made with Moses when he came down the mountain where they had to cover his face so that they could not see the glory on his face. And I grew up in the church, and what I grew up with was that they, they taught us that, that he covered his face because he had seen God, he was in the presence of God, and if the Israelites could have seen the glory of God, they would have died on the spot. You heard that before. But the truth that he reveals in 2 Corinthians is that the glory that was on his face, Patrick, was actually fading away. And the veil over his face was to hide the fact that the glory of the law was fading away. Oh, my God. I wish you could understand that. The glory of everything from Exodus chapter 16 to 31st, everything in Leviticus that you read as laws, commandments, and orders that God had given were fading away. He said don't have shellfish. That's fading away because now y'all eat some shrimps. He said the thing about not mixing fabrics was fading away because now you can enter in because the veil has been torn. Help me, somebody. He's saying he's, we've entered into this new covenant where the second Adam has given us a ministry of a new glory that takes us from this glory to another dimension of glory. So I said, this is about the management of glory. Throw the text up for me, my friend, and keep it up there for a second because I don't want them to lose it. So he says this is now the spirit. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is restriction. There are some rules and orders and, 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 and things that you must be uh, behaving and and. and, 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 and it says, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom, there is release, there is you go and be more than you go and do. There's freedom. All right, go on next verse, next verse. It says, so he says this, he says, and we all, we, and we we all, with unveiled face, unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image. Into the what? The same into the what? The same I need you to help me. Into the same image. We're being transformed into the same image. Oh, my God. We're being transformed into the same image dimension, into the same likeness, into the same order, into the same authority, into the same dominion, into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We're going from one dimension of glory to another dimension. We're, we're, we're not going down in 
we're not downsizing our, our glory, but rather we're elevating in glory. The more I, I know about God, the more I walk with God, the more I trust God, the more I learn of him, I become more like him. I'm transformed, and this is the Christian walk. It's, I'm not going back, I'm moving forward. Are you with me? I'm moving where? Forward. I'm only growing. I know I got some setbacks in my life, but I'm still moving forward because God will multiply by subtracting. You've got to trust godly math. He will multiply your life by subtracting. He'll, he'll divide you only to add to you. From one degree to glory to one degree. Oh, I feel a... a, 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 a a, a Mr. Jefferson uh, anointing on me. I, I, I'm moving on up to the sky to a deluxe. I, I'm, thank you, thank you. Janae corrected me. From one glory to another. And that glory is all about being transformed into the same image. And the, 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 in the order of the management of glory, we must understand that humanity had a, a cataclysmic event that took place where we once were created in glory, but then glory was foreclosed on. And then Jesus came and restored that glory to us. And now that we have that glory through what he did on the cross and, and, and how he rose from the dead, we now start transcending and growing from one dimension of glory to another dimension of glory. No matter what happens in our life, we're constantly going from one glory to another. Yes, you, you may experience pain in your life, but you're still going from one glory to another dimension of glory. You, you may experience loss, but you're going from one glory to another. You may experience a foreclosure on your home, but you're going from one glory to another sense of glory. You may experience a breakup where they leave you hanging dry, but you're still going from one glory to another glory. You may lose your job, but you're still going from one glory to another glory. They may talk about you on social media, but you're still going from one glory to another glory. They may have private meetings about you and what you've done and where you've been, but you're still going from one glory to another level of glory. Don't mess with my glory. Don't, you, you can't jack my glory. You have no word to say, Tiffany, about my glory because it wasn't borrowed from you. I didn't rent my glory. It's not on lease. It's mine. Are y'all with me? Our problem is that we derive glory and we only will speak about the glory if it's from circumstances. And we don't inform our circumstances of our identity in glory. May I ask you, what causes your depression? Circumstances. What's not happening fast enough? What's not happening now? What did happen that was not in accordance to the plan that I had made? And now I'm depressed, ready to freak, faint, and fall out because things aren't happening in the way that, that they should be. What, what could be better? You're, you're constantly in this gap of, 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 of they did this, and now I, I, I feel bad because here's where I stand. And your happiness requires something to happen. Your happiness requires something to happen. That's why the Bible doesn't speak too much about happiness. It talks about joy. The distinction. Fact and truth, joy and happiness. Two different things. Y'all with me? So let's go to the beginning. Can we go to that beginning? Because I, I parked on that word image. Image. We're being transformed to the image, right? So let's go back to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26. If you'll turn there with me. Genesis chapter 1, verses 26. So the Bible begins like this. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created the heavens and the earth. 
Verse 2, and the earth became formless and void. Something happened right there. We'll talk about that in September. Come back to that in September. Park right there. In September, here's a little announcement, a little commercial. In September, my series is entitled, Just Like the Days of Noah, The Truth About Aliens, UFOs, Artificial Intelligence, and Elon Musk. <laughs> We're going to talk about things that you never hear talked about in church. It's going to be fun. You, you may not want to return after that series, but you know, but you'll never see things the same again. So, in the beginning, God created heavens and earth. Earth became formless and void. Then God said, let there be light. He separates the lands from the seas. He creates the birds of the, uh, the sky and the things that creep on ground. He, he does all these things. And then in verse 1, uh, 26, he, 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 he gets to this place where he says, let us create man. Let us create what? Man, mankind. Let us create man in our Say it again. Let us create man in our image. After our... Let us create man in our... After our... Was God making a fake Rolex? Was he creating a counterfeit $100 bill? What was he creating when he was creating mankind? Children that were like him after his image, after his likeness. Are you following me? Because I've been to Los Angeles and New York City where a guy on the street will pull out his jacket and say, would you like to buy a watch? And you know that it's not the real thing. So when, 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 when you think about yourself and you think about your relationship to God, are you thinking that there is something different about you or are you thinking that there's something just alike about you? Help me. That's a real question. Was God creating a fake Rolex? Or was he faking something? Was he creating something that was just like him. Because there's a difference between a replica and a duplicate. He says, I want to create a being that has authority like me. That walks in dominion like me. That is creative like me. That thinks like me. That talks like me. That has dominion like me. That has, that has rulership like me. That is a prince like me. I want them to walk into every environment and be my representative that, so that when people and things see that being, they're seeing me. Are you with me? Let us create man in our image after our and let them. So, so, so what you got there is an identity. Who are you? Nah, no, y'all are stuck on, on your pronouns. That's what you want to be stuck on. Who are... No, I'm Puerto Rican. Negro, you're still black. No, I'm Mexican. You're just black turned inside out. Beth is like, don't leave me out. You may be Irish, German, whatever, but you're just an African up north. I want you to understand this because in this world, we're stuck on this identity crisis of who am I, who am I, what are we, what am I, this is my group, and this, this, these are my people, etc., etc. I'm a Bulls fan, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Lakers fan, I'm, I'm this, in, in this, these identities, when the fact remains is that that's just a confusion of who you truly are. When's the last time you considered of yourself, I am an imager of God? My pronouns are imager of God after his likeness. Plain and simple. No, it's, it's, it's she, her, him, shim. Get out of here with that nonsense. Because in Christ, 
Galatians, there's neither male nor female, Greek. Can I preach it to you? In, in Christ Jesus, there is neither any of those things that you want to describe yourself by. For we are just all in Christ, an imager. Oh, sheesh. I don't want to hear this type of preaching. You want to be stuck in your little groups. Let them have... So, so, so identity, imager, after his likeness, that's who I am. Amen? Yes. Can we go home now? Yes. Imager, after his likeness, that's who I am. I know who I am. I know who I am. I know who I am. I am yours and you are mine. Jesus, you are mine. You are mine. Jesus. That's who I am. When I step into a room, let them know I'm an imager. I've arrived. Then he gives you your role, what you're supposed to do. Let them have dominion. Let them have what? Let them have dominion. Let them have authority. Let them have rulership. Let them have lordship. Let them have command of everything that has breath in it. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. Help me, somebody. Everything that's in the waters, the dolphins, the whales, the sharks, the orcas, the leviathans. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens. The eagle in its majesty is under my rule. Let them have dominion over the livestock, the domesticated animals, the wild beasts, over the earth, and every, every creeping thing. Hello, somebody. Every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Hello, TLC or whoever sang the song Creep. Every creeping thing. Is there anything that's missing? Is there anything alive that's missing? Let them have rulership. Let them have dominion. Let them have authority. Let them have lordship. Let them have rulership and, and, and command. And, and, and these, these are the, the directions. This, this right here represents the only law that God gives in the beginning where there's perfection in humanity. Number one, know who you are. You're an imager. You're just like me. Rule number two, be fruitful, multiply, and have dominion. Dominion over what? Everything. Everything. You are in control over everything on this. You are the kings and queens of this planet. Now, th this is where I have issues, y'all. Like, like I, I, I read this. And I have issues. Can somebody grab Janelle for me? I just have issues. I, I, just, I just get all kinds of issues. Just like, you know, they, they got you, Amanda. Someone's getting her. We'll let them miss the service. <laughs> let them just have, like, like, God, like, he gives them these commands. He says, let them have dominion. He says, remember who you are and, and all this stuff. And, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Aaron, what's the other thing he told them? Uh, in this same state here, he told them one more thing. Of, huh, what's that? Don't eat from that one tree. Because if you do, 
you'll die. What's that? Just that one. They got apple trees, orange trees, pear trees, all the different varieties, pomegranates. All kinds of other things like that. And so, and, and so like, you know, they've got dominion over the birds, dominion over the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the air, dominion over, over cats and dogs. Come here, come here, Gina. They've got dominion over all these things. Now, now my, at my house, we have, we've got these plants inside the house, in front of the house, and, and there's some bees over there. So I brought, I brought some bees for, for Janelle to handle for me. What, what's wrong? What's wrong? What, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with you and bees? It'll kill me. The bee will kill you. It can. It can. Would it be safe and responsible for me to release some bees in your presence? No. What would you think about me? I would think that you hated me. Thank you very much. That's all, that's all we needed you for. I know of her issues with bees. It can kill her. Deathly allergic to bees. And the moment she knows there's a bee around, she's aware of it and she'll hide from it. She'll remove the danger. God says, you have dominion, you're an imager, stay away from that tree. At this point, I'm like, I need to call the cosmic CPS on God because he's an irresponsible parent. Not at one point does God say, there's this snake on the loose. And, it's, and it talks. There's a talking snake, Pauline. In the garden, just, you know, as you're having dominion, there's a snake. And this snake is going to come and start talking to you. Why didn't God warn them about the snake? He didn't warn them about a snake. He didn't tell them about sin. Not one mention of sin. The only law that they had was remember who you are in me and have dominion over everything. Because the snake is a creep. The serpent is a creep. Pastor Scott and I were talking about this, and, and, and uh, he says, this is what Pastor Scott does. He goes, oh. Whenever I'm sharing the theology with him, that's his response. No, actually, it's more like, let me, let me show you something better. <laughs> Let's take this to a whole nother level. He says, one day, one day, he was in the backyard, and uh, Poema and Sophia were playing, and Cambria had come over. I want you, I want, over to her family, I want you to know the type of people you entrust your children with. <laughs> this man was watching your child play with his children. And as they were playing, there was a large snake in the tree right above where they were playing. Do you, has he told you this before? Okay, he did inform you. Okay? There was a snake. And so the snake is just hanging out. And Scott sees the snake and he's like, oh, glory to God. <laughs> Praise be. <laughs> and if you know Pastor Scott, that's not what he said. <laughs> he loves Jesus, but he cusses a lot. I only cuss a little. And so I said, so what did you do? And he says, I went and I 
quietly, carefully removed the children from the presence of the snake. And I think you called someone to come and remove the snake. You removed the snake yourself. My God. I will be calling you if I ever have that issue. And I asked him, I said, what would, you, what would have happened if you had said to the kids, kids, there's a snake near you? The kids would have been disempowered and would have been aware of danger and only have a consciousness of fear of the danger. I'm a good parent. I tell my kids, watch out for this. If there's danger, I remove it. I hate, to, I hate going to places like love to play and jumping trampoline parks. You know why? Because the entire time, I hate bounce houses. Shame on you if you have a bounce house at your birthday party and invite my kids over there. <laughs> or if you come to my house and you see a bounce house. It wasn't my choice. Because all I'm watching for is they're going to bump their heads, they're going to get a concussion, and now I'm like, and, and the, I, I'm always calculating what could go wrong. I remember we were having a pool party at Tim and Steven's house, and, and the kids were jumping in the pool, and all I was thinking was like, oh my God, I hope these dudes have insurance. They were swinging each other and all kinds of stuff. I was like, let me find out what kind of insurance and which one of my kids I'm willing to have a severe accident with so we can get paid. So I was like, I looked around, I was like, I don't think they got insurance. So I said, if your last name is Belima, get out of the pool right now. Let the overturf kids get hurt. I'm watching out for the danger. I want to tell you something. Every fear that you have in your life is because you have awareness of danger. We raise up our children this way. Everything that's held me back in my life was something was, that was informed to me by parents or people in authority. Watch out for those white people. <laughs> Care for the Mexicans. I know y'all heard that. Did, did you, raise your hand if you heard something like it. Watch out, from, watch out from, for the, those Negroes from the south side. East side, my bad. And so you grow up having an awareness of Chinamen. Am I not telling the truth? And we project this thing like, oh, he, he looks like he's different. Watch out. I, I, when I was, Pauline and I were dating, and, uh, you know, it was getting serious, and so I, I went to my dad. I was like, Dad, I think I'm going to ask her to marry me. And he was like, well, you need to speak to the family back home in Africa. Tell them what is happening. You need to talk to Uncle Ken. So I called up Uncle Ken. I was like, Uncle Ken, I'm, I met this girl. And he's like, who is she? Is she worthy to be a Belima? I said, yeah, she's really nice. She's, she's Canadian. Ah, Canada is a country. Who are her people? I'm like, oh, she, she's actually Syrian. Syrian? Is she an Arab? I'm like, yes, yeah, she's an Arab. Be careful of Arabs. They're very erratic. I hear that they're the bomb. Everything that you overthink and have a fear about was someone who gave you an awareness that disempowered the fact that you're an imager. That you should not have any fear of circumstantial experiences. Just remember who you are. Are you understanding me? So uh, we, we, we inform and we train and we groom each other into having these fears and, and these, these issues. And, and so in Genesis chapter 3, one day um, uh, Adam and Eve are chilling out and they're butt naked. 
but they don't know. Why? Because to them, they're just imagers. So when they look at each other, they're like, oh, you're just an imager. That's what God looks like. Hello, somebody. Am I helping you out? I'm walking in, you're walking in your glory. Hello, different, different connotation there. You're an imager. There is nothing that you lack. You're an imager. After his likeness in there, they're hanging out, they're enjoying life, they're eating the apples, the oranges, the pomegranates, and all these things, and they're naming animals, and they're enjoying life, they're walking in dominion, and one day this talking serpent shows up. And, and, and they're just going, oh my gosh, go to, go to Genesis chapter 3, please. Uh, and and the, the serpent shows up, and, and the serpent's like, um, excuse me, Mrs. Eve, um, did God really say that you cannot eat of any tree in the garden? Give me my verse, please. Thank you. Go back to verse 1, please. Uh, I, the serpent was more crafty. Everyone say crafty. The serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. The serpent was more crafty than anything else. It was a supreme being in terms of the animals and beasts that God had created. We're together there. It was superior to anything else. But yet in its superiority, what did God say to humanity? It's under me. It's beneath me. And he said to the woman, did God actually say, <laughs> I just want to get some clarification. Did God really say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And here's how lies work, Stephen. Lies only work when there's 99% truth. A lie that has 99% lie is not a good lie. It needs to have an element of truth to it. And just a little... <coughs> The only word there that, 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 has the, that makes this a lie is the word any. Watch Eve's. I, I wish Eve would have just been like, hey, you're beneath me. Why are you talking to me? Don't look me in the eyes when you talk to me. Make an appointment next time. She responds in verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. Go on. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. So here we understand that she did not have a revelation of what God actually said, all she had was information. And the problem with your life is that you don't take what God has said as revelation, but you take it only as information, which you can manipulate to suit your own thinking. Because that's not what God told Adam. She did not have a revelation. And my hope and my prayer for you is that you would have a revelation of what God has spoken over your life. But the serpent said to the woman, oh, ridiculous. That's the dumbest thing ever. You won't die. You will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And what's happening there is this. It's a very crafty thing that happens in every con man, every manipulator. What they will do is that they will make you feel as if someone is holding something back from you. <laughs> this is the lie that runs this world. This is the algorithm of this planet. Why? Because the controller of the algorithm is in charge. His name is the devil. That's why he separates us because, oh, the Democrats are holding us back from this. Oh, the Republicans are holding this back from us. And the, and the liberals are doing this. And, and the blacks are doing this. And the Mexicans are oh, they're, they're taking our jobs. And they're, they're, holding, they're taking something from us. And that's what runs and regulates this planet. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. 
then you'll, you'll be woke. And then you'll be like God. My question is this. At what point, Natalie, at what point did Eve forget she, who she was? At what point did Eve forget her identity? At what point did she forget that the way that I'm made, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. At what point did she feel as if she needed some cosmetics? At what point did she say that I'm ugly without my makeup, like some of you who won't FaceTime unless you're made up? Are you ugly with your makeup, without your makeup? Beth's like, I don't have any on. Because she's walking in her glory. At what point did she forget? At what point did she get amnesia? At what point did she forget to remember that God made her? At what point did she forget that this serpent is one of those creeping things that creeps around the ground of the earth and it needs to be put in its place? Do not allow a lesser being inform you of who you are because if it can change what you think about yourself at that point, it will pull you down. Do not, let me say it like this, do not let your haters become, do, do not become an elevator for your haters. Pastor Scott was talking about crabs, what crabs do, that, that, that they're just operating how they, this is how they do life. They know where they are, and so they see you up there, and so they say, I want to be up there, and the only way I can get up there is if I hold on to you and bring you down. And how do they do it? You ain't all that. So you overthink. You overthink. The difference between people who succeed and make it in life that are less talented than you, it's all about how they think about themselves. Incompetent people achieve at a greater degree than competent people because competent people have a struggle from knowing too much about how not skilled they are, about what they lack. They have an awareness of what's out there, but not an awareness of who's in here. Am I helping you? Mm -hmm. You hear on Instagram, I don't understand why she has a thousand likes for that post. I think it wasn't that profound. Do you know how long I thought about my post? <laughs> to carefully craft it? Do you know how many selfies I took to make this perfect post? And you spent 20 hours on that one post, and they just post out content after content after content, gaining followers and influence and, 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 and monetizing and, and all this stuff, and you just you're like, I don't know if it's good enough. I'm not, yeah, it's not that good. You know what? I don't have a degree. I don't have the qualifications. Does this, does, it, does this make sense? And you call your 20 friends and you say, what do you think about this? And they're like, you should, you should post it. And like, are you sure it's good enough? There's a study called the Dunning-Kruger study. Look it up. Dunning, D-U-N-N-I-N-G, Kruger, K-R-U-G-E-R. One of the most profound things I've read in, in 10 years. And, and the Dunning-Kruger, it was a study. And the study was based off of an incident, a bank robbery that took place in Ohio, I believe it was. The bank robbery took place because this bank robber, how many of y'all believe that most bank rob robbers are stupid? At least the ones that get caught. So it's always a dumb mistake. This is the dumbest bank robber ever. True story, look it up. Just, just Google bank robber lemon juice. Okay, don't do it now, do it later. Um, uh, and so, so this bank robber heard that if you put lemon juice on your face, it makes your face uh, invisible to security cameras. So he went and robbed a bunch of ba uh, banks with lemon juice on his face, thinking that he was invisible to the cameras. So when they were prosecuting him, they're like, why didn't you wear a mask? This is like, we've never seen a bank robber who just walks in there like, hey. 
I want the money. <laughs> he's like, I had the juice on my face. There's no way. And he's like, there's no way. This is going to be overturned because I had the juice. And that incident got Dunning and Kruger to put the study. He says that incompetent people who don't know their incompetence achieve more because they believe more about who they are. And competent people never achieve the things that incompetent people achieve because they're aware that there's a better singer out there. There's a better writer out there. There's a better, there's someone who's more trained than I am. There's, and, and here's the thing about when you're walking in God, it's never about your ability. It's never about your experience. It's all about who do you think you are. Are you an imager? Are you walking in dominion? Can you walk into a room and say, I deserve to be here because I know my maker. I'm approved by the manufacturer. I don't have imposter syndrome because I am the artifact that he created. I am not a Folex. I am the Rolex. I'm not a copy made by man. I'm stitched and put together by the maker. In his likeness, in his image. Oh, man. Am I, am I helping you? Yeah. And she eats it. She eats the fruit. My issue is like, why didn't God warn her about the serpent? Why didn't he warn her? God does not need to warn you. You know, like, my parents didn't pre prepare me for this stuff that I'm facing. Wasn't their job, wasn't God's job to prepare, to prepare them for a serpent. God's job was to let them know who they are. And let them know what they have dominion over. What they have rulership over. Because if you can understand that, it doesn't matter what gets thrown your way. Am I helping you? The moment, the moment they eat of the fruit, they realize, oh, snap, I'm naked. Oh. First time that Adam experienced shrinkage. <laughs> Had to hide his junk. First time they started feeling inadequate. Pauline, I remember I was a kid. I was, I was a kid in Bering Springs, Michigan, and I had, I had four friends. I mean, they were all from one family, all right? <laughs> There was Elvin, Elvis, Eldridge, and Elkridge. But they were cool. And they had an older sister named Jocelyn. They were cool. And, and, and this is not to offend anybody, but, but they were pudgy kids, man. They were little, you know, little chunky kids. And my nickname growing up was Bone. I was super skinny. My abs had abs. So one day we went swimming, and Jocelyn, the older sister, who all of us followed Jocelyn, we thought she was the coolest person ever. Jocelyn looks at me, and she says, Jonathan, you don't have any love handles. But Elvin has love handles. Eldridge has love handles. Elvis has love handles. But you don't have any love handles. And I'm looking at myself, I don't have any love handles. I'm like, I need love handles. I need love handles. Right around the age of 32, oh God, I got some love handles. And ever since then, I've been trying to get rid of them. But all my life, I felt less than because I did not have what? Love handles. I don't want yours. Mine are enough. Do you see how serpents in the field confuse you? I know people who hate going back home for the holidays because they put on three pounds and they know that their parents, all their life, that all their life, their mom told them, don't be fat, don't be fat, don't be fat, don't be fat.
why do we let lesser frequency beings who are operating in a dimension that's not spiritual inform us of who we are? Why? I'm coming from a season where I've let lesser beings try to confuse what I think about me, what I think about my ministry, what I think about my calling, what I think about my church, what I think about my relationships, when they are nothing more than serpents trying to confuse what I think about who God made me to be. That's what's been controlling your life. God shows up and like, Adam, Adam, where are you? Which, by the way, when God calls Adam, he's not just calling the man, he's calling both of them because Eve did not get her name until after. They were both Adam. Where are you? We were naked, and so we hid, and we made these fig leaves. I don't care if they're Armani, Louis Vuitton fig leaves. They're just fig leaves. Who told you that you're naked? Who told you that you're ugly without makeup? Who told you that you needed a Maserati to feel important? That you needed a Mercedes? That you needed this job? You needed this square footage? Who told you that? Why couldn't you just be content in me? Did you eat? He didn't say, did you talk to a serpent? He didn't say, did Lucifer show up? The danger was never the devil. The danger was you forgetting who the heck you are. It was not about the circumstances. It was, it, the only way you could eat that is because you forgot that it was me that sustained you. Kept you and held you together. The only way that you'd have done that is you forgot who you are, Alyssa. You forgot who you are. My son Zion, number one, he's brilliant. I remind him every day. And I don't know how he does the things that he does, really. Every day he reminds me that he's smarter than me. He's more gifted. I'm like, dude, you're just amazing. For some reason, this week he decided that he was going to crack the code on TikTok. He had 75 followers on Tuesday, and now he has over 900. I'm like, he's like, I'm like, how'd you do it? He's like, oh God, he's like, Dad, this is what you do. And then you, the algorithm does this, and you put this hashtag, and I'm like, my brother, start a course. And so he goes, I have, I have over, I have, at that time, he was like, I have, I'm only 30 people away from having 900 followers. And then he looked at me and says, how many people follow you, Dad? <laughs> like I, and I'm like, he's like, I know how many people follow you on TikTok. You only have 15 followers. <laughs> I'm like, in my life, I only have four people who follow me. He says, who are they? I'm like, Zion, Zara, Jazz, and Justice. He says, no, you have five. I'm like, who's the fifth person? He says, mommy follows you. I'm like, nope, she does not follow me. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. She doesn't follow me. Be careful. She's her own person. She doesn't follow me. You follow me. He says, he's, and then Zion looked at me and said, you're right, mommy doesn't follow you. She follows Kim Kardashian. <laughs> Who told you you need a BBL? Kim Kardashian. Who told you you needed that makeup? Kim Kardashian. An entire generation of people who are following a serpent called Kardashian. Am I helping you? Because everything that regulates how you move and your standards of beauty are what that serpent tells you are. I'm not saying that she's a serpent, but you get what I'm saying. 
pastor calls Kim Kardashian a serpent. <laughs> they foreclosed on their identity to a serpent who once had rulership over the garden. You may not have heard this before, but Lucifer was called the Prince of Eden in all his splendor until iniquity was found in him. And he said, I will ascend into heaven and raise my throne above God's throne. And then he was cast down. Ezekiel, we'll talk about this in September when I preach about, just like the days of Noah, the truth about aliens, UFOs, artificial intelligence, and Elon Musk. I don't know why Elon Musk is in there, but it just felt as if it was appropriate. And he was cast down, and he lost his authority as the ruler of the planet because God said, now I will not have a created creature, an angel, be the ruler of earth. I'm going to create man in my own image, and I'm going to have them have dominion over everything. And so here, this jealous hater starts creeping around trying to get authority back. And how does he operate? He operates by stealing your identity so he can reclaim his rulership as the prince of the power of the air. Are you getting me? So in Matthew chapter 4, we'll go home in a second. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Before this, Jesus has, you remember this, Jesus gets baptized. John, the forerunner to the gospel, his cousin, six months older than he is, has been preaching that there's one who's coming, whose who's, who's sandals I'm not worthy to tie up. And when he comes, he will usher into the kingdom. He, behold the lamb that takes away the sins of the earth. And he, and Jesus shows up, and, and he goes up to John and says, John, baptize me. And John says, I'm not worthy to baptize you. And Jesus says, unless you baptize me, all righteousness will not be fulfilled. Nobody else's baptism will matter because it will be a man-made baptism. They need my baptism, and so you must baptize me. So John baptizes Jesus, and when Jesus is baptized, something happens. A voice, a, a dove the Holy Spirit descends upon him like a dove, and a voice from heaven says, This is my son in whom I am well pleased. That's my boy, and I'm proud of him. That's my boy, and I'm proud of him. He hasn't performed one miracle. He hasn't turned water to wine. He has not, he's not opened the eyes of the blind. He has not, he's not opened up the ears of those who are deaf. He has not healed a man with a withered hand. He has not walked on water. He has not fed the 5,000. He has not gone to the cross and died. He has not been resurrected. All he did was get baptized. And God says, I approve of him. That's my boy. That's my son. And I approve of him. Golly, why do you base your experience with God on your performance for him when he's proud of you without performance? That's my boy. If he treats Jesus that way, what makes you different, Eric? Why do you walk through life with guilt of like what I did, what I didn't do, what I'm not doing for God and what I didn't do and what I do? And God's just like, I'm proud of you. You're my child. Behold what manner of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God, sons and daughters of God. The same way, after his likeness, after his image. Are you getting this? And immediately after he's baptized, the Spirit of God leads him into the desert to be tempted by the devil. My Lord, I want you to get this, Riley. God himself in the Spirit leads Jesus to the desert. He leads Jesus, his son, to the place of danger where the serpent is. Miles, God is going to lead you 
to where the danger is. He places you in the place of danger. But all you want to do is avoid danger. Avoid toxic people. Avoid circumstances. Oh, don't want to be around those people. Because they'll jump on me. Oh, you can go back to your seat, sorry. <laughs> Led by the Spirit to the place of danger. <laughs> to be tempted. There was a purpose. Maybe there was a purpose for Adam and Eve to be placed where the danger was. But the second Adam, when the danger shows up, that same serpent shows up and says, if, what does he say? Jesus led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. See, I wasn't, I wasn't making it up. It's right there in Scripture. Go to the next verse. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was what? He was 40 days of not eating. He is what? Hungry. And the tempter, the same serpent, shows up and said to him, if you are the Son of God. Same temptation. Same rhetoric to Eve. A question of identity. Why? I can pull you down by shaking your identity. I can stop the plan of salvation for all humanity if I jack up Jesus' identity. If you're the Son of God, turn these, these rocks into bread. But he answered, it is written, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. But by every word that comes from the mouth of God. But by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I am only going to walk and talk and operate in the spirit of what God has spoken over my life. Outside of that, nothing matters. Everything that the devil came at him with was a question of, of identity. Notice that. Can, can, I, can I show you something? Can I show you something very profound? Can, can, I show, can I give you a prescription of how to get through life? Can, can I give it to you? You promise to, to follow it? When the crap hits the fan, when the circumstances are bad, when something is trying to shake you up on the inside, just do what Jesus did. It is written. It is written. God said this about me. God said this about me. I don't care what they say about you, Tiffany. God said this about me. I don't care which pastor condemned you. God said this about me. I don't know how many times they guilted you into things and guilted you about what you... God said this about me. God said this. Man shall not live by bread alone. I don't care about the cosmetics. I don't care about the stuff. Just like Jazz said it to me, this body came from God. All you can do is give me stuff. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 10, verse 16, he says, Behold, I'm sending you. What is he doing? He's sending you as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as that crafty serpent. Be just as wise and innocent as doves. I'm not going to keep you from the haters. Just don't become an elevator for your haters by forgetting who you are. Why? Because the second Adam did not forget who he was. And on your behalf, he 
who was without sin became like those who have sin so that we become the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God. The first Adam did not have the righteousness of God. He had the innocence of humanity, but Jesus gives you the righteousness of God. The right, that, is a, that is a new form of glory, amen? It's a new form of glory. And so he says, I'm sending you like sheep amongst wolves, but you will survive. Why will you survive? Because the very same power that rose Jesus from the dead is now alive on the inside of you. I am giving you my spirit who will guide you, who will give you the law, who will give you the righteousness and the power to overcome. The very same power that he had, he gives to you. The very same identity that he has, he gives to you. But he does better than Adam and Eve. Because Adam and Eve never got the spirit on the inside. You're sealed. Ooh, come on, Stevie Wonder. You're signed, sealed, and delivered. <laughs> I don't care what your circumstances are. Based on that, you are his glory. You share in his glory. Pastor, I heard that God doesn't share his glory with anybody. I'll show you. First Corinthians. Come back next week. I love the Catholics. But Catholicism has made Christianity a subservient religion of you being less than and it creeps into all forms of evangel evangelicalism and pro protestantism and nobody wants to discuss the fact that we are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh children of God higher than the angels for to which one of the angels did God ever say that you are my son Hebrews chapter 1 but to you he says behold what manner of love the father has given unto you that you should be called the sons of God May that inform your reality, Marina. May you walk in that. Amen? Amen? I'm not done to be continued. God, I pray for your people. I ask that they may receive this word. That it may, not, it may grow fruit in their life that changes everything about their life. Thank you for Jesus who made it all possible. The second Adam who did not forget who he was and therefore foreclosed his identity to a lesser being. But put the devil in his place so that we can trample over serpents. Jeez, that's the promise you gave us that we will be able to trample over that which trampled over Adam and Eve. And so we go from glory to glory. In Jesus' name I pray.